We're glad you're here tonight. We are spending all summer long through the end of August on Wednesday nights talking about faith questions. We did this last summer over a one-week period, but this year we're stretching it out one lesson per week and studying some of the things that people told us last summer. They would ask God if they could have one question to ask God and then adding some things that we just hear from friends and, and from our culture and from our community. So it's been a great study so far. And I hope it'll continue to be. And if you're watching this on the live stream, whether it's tonight or whether it's two years from now, you see on there how you can reach out to us by email or uh, through Twitter. Please do that. No matter when you're seeing this, we'd be happy to help you any way you can. Of course, that goes for everybody that's here, too. If we can help you in any way, please let us know. I'm excited tonight to have Jimmy Moffitt with us. Um, Jimmy has a wonderful reputation uh, and a special place in a lot of people's hearts, especially among Churches of Christ here in Memphis, Tennessee. He worked for 42 years with the Raleigh Church of Christ, which has now moved out and become Bartlett Woods. We have a lot of common friendships back and forth with Bartlett Woods. Uh, it, I feel like every time he comes here to speak, it seems like a homecoming out in the lobby. It seems like so many of our congregation know him from years ago and, and have stories and great memories of him. Uh, he just has a wonderful reputation as someone who loves God, who loves people, and, and who wants to encourage people. And I really have appreciated getting to know him. Um, he's a graduate of Freed Hardman, the University of Memphis, and the Harding School of Theology. I love one thing I found uh, on the biography that, that we found on him, his favorite scripture, 2 Timothy 2.8, remember Jesus Christ. Uh, three simple words that he's lived out his whole life, and I'm excited to have him addressing our topic tonight. What is the Christian life like? Uh, something that's uh, sometimes wondered from the outside looking in. So we're excited to have Jimmy tonight. Please come speak to us. Thank you, Tim, for that uh, fine introduction. I'm always reminded when I hear things like that of what my wife Peggy used to ask me when that was things like that were said. She said, when you get up there, see if you can find out who they're talking about. And so, <laughs> but uh, I love to hear you say it anyway, and thank you. I, I like the spirit of this church. I've been with you several times, and uh, not just speaking, but worshiping with you. And I really appreciate your spirit. The last conversation that I had with Robert was on the day before he died, the next night or that next morning. And uh, we had a great visit. And one of the things that I will remember very specifically is that he talked about this church. He loved this church. And you know he worked with this church. And uh, he just uh, really had great things to say about you. And he specified to me especially that the work that Tim was doing was a great work and he was very complimentary of Tim and I am glad for that and hope that will continue uh, on for many many years several years ago uh, I developed the custom of thinking about when I preach about being under an archway. That was, I guess, easy to do because at Raleigh we had those big arches. And I like to think, think about I'm being under one of those arches, and on that arch are these words, Jesus Christ, Son and Savior. And then right under it, my Lord and my God. I have tried for a number of years to dedicate my teaching and preaching to upholding that truth. Jesus is Son and Savior. He is my Lord and my God. And I hope tonight that uh, some of the things, maybe a few of the things that I will say, will fit into under that great arch because I believe everything that I say publicly in preaching and teaching 
has to fit under that arch. And so I've been assigned the subject, what is the Christian life like? Now, I hope that I will address this in a way that uh, will not disappoint you. I thought about it uh, ever since Tim called me, and this was several months ago, or seems like, <laughs> and I started making notes and had a folder for this. And the first thing I thought, I said, well, I'll just say read the New Testament. That's what the Christian life is like. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll just narrow that down to the Sermon on the Mount and Paul's uh, conclusion to most of his letters. But then I said, well, they're probably going to be expecting more of me than that. So I'll just try to add some of my thoughts with reference to what I believe the Christian life is like. And... I want to say, first of all, that I believe the Christian life is a life of commitment, a life of commitment. You know, the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy uh, 1, and I've forgotten the verse, I think it's about verse 15, but anyway, he said, I know in whom I believe. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now that's the way the King James reads, the way I memorize it. And I guess I quoted that scripture for years before I recognized that I was saying, For I know in whom I believe, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that. And then in studying it very carefully, I observed the end. There is no end between Jesus and the Apostle Paul. I know whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Many years ago, we had a service and training series in here in Memphis. And one year, the church in Fraser at that time, Floyd Road it was called, was in charge and they designated the theme total commitment, total commitment. And uh, we had a great series and a lot was said about total commitment and commitment was sort of a popular word in those days it seemed that by the work of some of the people that had written on commitment. But later, thinking about it, we talked about total commitment. But really, is there any other kind of commitment when it comes to following Jesus Christ? It should be total commitment. You know, if you were taken up in an airplane and you were told to parachute out and uh, you finally got to that stage and they, you jumped out or they pushed you out, you'd sort of feel like you had totally committed to the thing. And I believe in following Jesus Christ and trying to do those things that we understand him to tell us to do, that there should be total commitment. We are committed to following Jesus. When we tell somebody about Jesus Christ and we study with them about the Lord, it is my firm belief that if we can help people to come to love Jesus, you are to love Jesus, then what Jesus has for them to do will not be nearly the obstacle that sometimes it is. What does Jesus want you to do? What does Jesus want me to do? If we can solve that problem with the love that we have with the Lord, then I believe we can give the solution uh, much easier. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and verse 8, I think reflecting back on what Jesus had said to Thomas, he said uh, about Jesus, you have not seen him, but you love him. You have not seen him, 
but you love him. Remember what Jesus said to Thomas. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. Now, every one of us in this room that believes and follows Jesus Christ are in that category. We haven't seen Jesus. We uh, do not uh, claim to have seen any of his great works. We read and said it about them, but we have not seen him. And yet we love him with all our hearts. And that's why I admonish people, remember Jesus Christ. Several years ago, matter of fact, how many years ago it's been, we were meeting in the old Union Avenue Auditorium, uh, rather really in their basement. It was before they built that uh, first great educational building. And uh, they had, had a man in town by the name of Archie Looper. And they wanted us to come down and hear his spiel. And so I was a young preacher then, but I went along with a lot of others and had a good crowd. Brother Archer uh, got up and he gave his uh, program what he wanted us to support and help uh, people, uh, help him uh, promote this and do this of a good work. And he concluded his message with a story. He said there was a man who grew up in West Texas. He was a member of the church, but he went to California. And like so many people that go to California, he didn't remember the Lord. But he was a very successful man, became a, a great businessman, became a wealthy businessman, brought up his family, still not renewing his life for the Lord. And born into his family was this little boy, the last child, who was in a sense the apple of his eye. And he said that man just, you know, he couldn't get enough of that little boy. And one day the little boy got sick. They took him to the doctor, they ran the exams, and he had leukemia. Now that was long before they had any progress made in treating leukemia and the doctors told him that there's really not anything we can do for your little boy. He's just gonna die. But there is a clinic out in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, that you can go to and they, they're set up to help someone go through this uh, less painfully. And so this man being wealthy enough just uh, moved his entire family to Phoenix and put that little boy in that clinic and of course visited him every day. But he said the man was visiting his child one night and the little boy was getting much weaker. And he walked out of that building and went to, was going to his car. And then he said that man suddenly fell down on his knees. And he said, dear God, I've been so wayward. I've left you long ago. But dear God, if you will heal my little boy, I will give you my life and my fortune. And then he said, that man's little boy died. But the man said in his covenant to God, and if my little boy dies, I will give you my life and my fortune. Well, he almost had most of us grown men there uh, in a little bit in tears. And then he said, that man kept his commitment. I know he did because I am that man. And if you ever have occasion to read the history of Archie Looper, you will find about how he became so wealthy and how that in his later years, 
he gave his life and fortune to Jesus Christ. I believe that's what the Christian life is about. That's what it's like. It is commitment. The second thing the Christian life is like is about compassion. Compassion. I was reading this morning uh, in my devotional, just happened to read in Psalms 80, it was planned of course, reading in Psalms 86. And verse 15, the Lord is full of compassion. In the New Testament, especially in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the word compassion is only used four times. Three times it's used about Jesus himself, and one time in a story that Jesus told. But the first time is in Matthew 9 and verse 35 or 36. When Jesus looked out at the crowd and he had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then he gave that charge, pray you therefore with the Lord of harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. But he had compassion upon them. The second time is in Mark 1 and verse uh, 41. When the leper, he looks down at this leper and the record says he had compassion for him and he healed him. And then the third time is in Luke 7 and verse 14 when the widow woman was coming along with the corpse of her only son. And when Jesus saw that passing by, he had compassion on her, or the New English uh, translation will say, his heart went out to her, which is what compassion is. He had compassion on her. And you know the rest of the story. So the word compassion itself is not used over and over in the New Testament, but in a sense, it can almost on every page read something about compassion, how we are to be a caring people. If we are not a caring people, we're not a church of Christ. If we do not care for others and have compassion for them, we cannot call ourselves just New Testament Christians. New Testament Christians have to care. We must care. We have no choice but to care. And so I believe that the Christian life is a life of caring. A number of years ago, I read a book called uh, My Shadow Ran Fast. It's by Bill Sands. Uh, he's long deceased, but Bill Sands uh, was a prison reformer. And he wrote two books that I know of in particular about prison reform. But his story, he tells in the first book, My Shadow Ran Fast. He was brought up in a very well-to-do family in Los Angeles. His father was a judge. His mother was a, all involved in society. But there became a conflict in the family, and as a result of that conflict, Bill left home and went into a life of crime as a young teenager. His crime wave was so bad, badly that he became the youngest inmate in San Quentin Penitentiary. And when he was put into that penitentiary, he carried on with his same way of life and it wasn't long before he was in solitary confinement. And he says, one day I heard footsteps outside my cell. The door opened, and there stood the warden, Clinton Duffy, a man that I had known because my father and mother knew him. He walked into my cell and he sat down beside me. He said, Bill, why don't you come to yourself? 
Why don't you get wise and straighten out your life? You have a father that's very intelligent. You are a smart guy. You can, you can turn your life around if you want to. And he said, I shot back at him, why? Who cares? I have a father that won't even come see me. I have a mother that will not even send me a birthday card. Why? Nobody cares. And he said, my entire life was changed by three words from Clinton Duffy. He said, Bill, I care. Bill, I care. And you know, I have this feeling that there are a lot of things in your life and my life that if it is not done for other people, it won't ever be done. Now, I know that's a big responsibility, but you just think about it. There are some things that every one of us in this room, every one of us has the ability to care and express that care to someone else, some man, some woman, some child, in such a way as to influence that person. And if I don't do it, it will not be done. I know that's true because in my own life, if a lady had not come and knocked on our door and said, may I take Jimmy to Sunday school? I was about six years old then. May I take him to Sunday school? And she took me to Sunday school. And she moved, that was during the war years, beginning of First World War II. And uh, she moved. Within six months, we moved three blocks from her. And so again, she started taking me to Sunday school. And one day, when I was about 15, I made the good confession and was baptized into Christ. A few years ago, two of our brothers, Batsel Baxter and Norval Young, published a book called Preachers of Today. You may have one in your library. The first volume I filled out like they had the form and who baptized you. And uh, I put down Thomas Butler. But a couple of years later, they came out with another volume. And this time, I put down, I was baptized through the influence of Lillian Munns. I would not have come to Jesus if it had not been for Lillian. And I believe in my life and in your life, there are people who are waiting for us to express some kind of care for them and influence them for Jesus. The Christian life is a life of compassion. The third thing, the Christian life is a life of continuing. Now I know you English teachers are not gonna like the construction of my sons, but the Christian life is a life of continuing. You remember a passage that we hear so many times, especially if we go to funerals, where I've fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith, I've run the race. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, but not to me only, but to all of them that love his appearing. Paul said that, 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 and 8. But really, what is he saying? He is saying, I did not quit. I did not quit. And you know in that same little book of 2 Timothy, that he uses the phrase three times. Do your best. 
Now, it took me a while to realize this because I had memorized 2 Timothy 2.15, my first scripture that I can recall memorizing, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The later translations have do your best in the study of the word of God. Then later, do your best toward people. And then the last time, do your best toward your, your responsibility. Do your best to come before winter. But, but what I'm really stressing is that there's hardly any way that any of us can come to follow Jesus and not do our best. And so I'm here at the ripe old age. Well, you guess it. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I don't, I'm not ashamed of it. The Lord has blessed me with 85 years. And I'm nearer 86 <laughs> than I am back to 85. But that's another story. But, you know, I constantly think about this. Uh, I get calls to come do this or come do that. And <laughs> I can't say, I'm retired. I'm retired. No, not if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you can help somebody, you have to continue. And you have to continue praying. We don't catch up on our praying. We don't write our prayers out on a sheet of paper and tack them up to the head of our bed and jump in the bed and say, Lord, them's my sentiments. <laughs> praying. The longer we live and serve, the more we pray. And you know what I found in, even after my leaving full-time work and studying, keeping up my study, is that um, there's one thing that I did not stress enough, I know. And when you catch hold of this concept, you don't have any problem praying. His presence, the presence of God. I believe He's present here tonight. That's why I like to go to worship. I believe He's present with me other than at worship. Yes, I won't go into that. But I believe our Lord is here tonight with us, His presence. And so it's not hard to pray. We keep on praying. And we keep on telling. Every opportunity we have that we can introduce someone to Jesus, we want to sit down with that person and try to help them understand this book. We study the Word and we tell the Word. I have a quotation that I used to use in meeting work. And I would begin every sermon with this statement. If a man has a soul, and he has. And if that soul can be won or lost for eternity, and it can, then the greatest thing in the world is to bring a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl to Jesus Christ. I believe that. And I encourage people to do that. I was in a meeting down at... Uh, Corinth, Mississippi, a few years ago, Foot Street Church. And uh, one of those congregations that was kind enough to invite me back. And so I went the second time for a meeting. And when I walked into the foyer, <laughs> this old gentleman met me. He said, oh, I remember you. You're the preacher that started every sermon with the same quotation. I thought to him, well, I got my... what was that quotation he said? <laughs> <laughs> so we do our best and we try and we struggle, but still, but still, if a man has a soul, reach out to that soul. Continue. I'm going to close by telling you one more story. I know a homiletical professor would 
give me F on this message tonight because I've told too many stories. I know that. But who, who cares if I get an F? <laughs> but I hesitate to tell it because it's just a little bit too close to me. But I tell it because I want you to know that when I say we must continue, it is genuine. In 2001, our granddaughter, Carrie, came down with osteosarcoma, cancer of the bone. She was 16 years old. She was a brilliant student a great athlete, but she had to spend two years coming and going in St. Jude Hospital. Two months before she died, I was standing in the room when the doctor said to her, we can't do anything else. It's the only time I ever saw her cry during that whole thing. I can't do anything else. But during those two years, she had continued to study and study and study. And as I said, and now I'm bragging, she's, she made 36 on her ACT test, that's perfect, on math, composition. Literature, she made 34. And so, now here she has two years, two months to live. And she always thought I knew a lot more about literature than I did. I, I fooled her there. But we set in because that child was determined to take that exam again and make a 36. And she did with maybe a month to live. And she made a 34 again. And she said to me, Pop, I never have liked literature. <laughs> <laughs> now, here I am, hobbling, crippled, can't preach like I used to, maybe never could. But when I think about, I'm going to quit. You know, I put up with all of these people who get up in the morning and they look in the mirror and they say, who can I irritate today? I'm not going to put up with that anymore. Can't do that. The Apostle Paul had his persecutions, his beatings. I've never been persecuted. I've never been beaten. But I've had to do what Richard Baggett used to say, puncture a lot of balloons. And, you know, you're kindly like some of you are, some of you that are teachers, that uh, you've hung it up. <laughs> I'll put in my time. And I don't mean to imply you shouldn't have a re refresher course, <laughs> a relief. But you can't quit. You really can't quit. You've got to continue on till Jesus comes. So those are just a few of the things that I think about when I think about what is the Christian life like. It is commitment. It is compassion. It is continuing. And so I admonish you, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, do all the good you can in all the ways you can for as long as ever you can. If anyone needs to come tonight, we stand ready to help you while together we stand and sing. Oh.
song and then we'll be dismissed in prayer by brother steve grinder uh, thank you brother moffitt for your message tonight and for the wisdom that you shared with us if you would now turn to number 570